and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Coming up, I take a look at the Pymania story. I play some games. I have a chat to Jeff. And end with some educational titles. Let's get on then. those old enough to remember when it happened, will recall the hype, the excitement, the humour and the sheer madness of Automata's invention. It was the first real-world treasure hunt computer game in the UK, and released in 1982 it took a long time to win the prize. Automata was a software company set up by Mel Croucher and Christian Penfold, later joined by Andrew Stagg, and I covered Automata in a very early episode, episode number two, but I wanted to look specifically at Pymania. The game was released for the Dragon 32, the ZX81, the BBC and the Spectrum, boasting a grand prize of a diamond encrusted golden sundial worth £6,000. This is my version of the game, and it came with this sticker, has anyone else got one of these? To win this oh, the player had not only to complete the game, but gather clues from within the game itself that pointed to a location and a date and time and they had to turn up on that date and time to claim the prize. This limited the chance of getting it right to just once a year. The game begins in a very odd fashion. It's text and graphic adventure with just 21 locations, but they were all clues. The first puzzle is a simple screen. What do you do here? It took me a while when I first played it. What key? What could it possibly be referring to? A key linked to the Pyman, perhaps? Yes, you simply had to press the Pi key on the Spectrum. Once past this, we get an introduction from the Pi Man before the game begins for real. The locations consisted of strange places, such as the Cave of Ivory, the Sewer Pipe and the Oily Drum. All pretty meaningless, until you actually draw a map. Before this though, we get another clue. Time is on your side. And this means that to navigate the game map, you have to use the 12 numbers on a clock face. And the next location gives us a puzzle. 3 from 12. Using the clock face, there are only two numbers that are three places away from the 12, and that's 3 or 9, and these are the only two routes from here. Yes, it's a bit bizarre, but it was fun to work out. There are plenty of items to collect too. Again, all bizarre. A saxophone, a pork pie, a rubber duck, and so on. The pie man turns up at various points, and may or may not help you depending on what sort of mood is in, and what you give him based on that. For example, if he's bored, he likes hula hoops or a saxophone. The location descriptions are basic. Many commands are not understood and sometimes the response is a bit slow. But the game became very popular, with people all around the country trying to work out what the riddles meant and claim the prize. There were several reviews of the game and the usual interviews with Automata, all adding to the hype. Magazines even published hints from readers desperately trying to complete the game and get the clues to the whereabouts of the sundial. Automata themselves, using the back pages of Popular Computing Weekly, often scattered things within their normal cartoon, offering clues, or maybe not, to the readers. Many people got the date, derived from the value of pi. And if you hadn't guessed, pi can be written as 22 over 7, therefore the date is the 22nd of July. And some people turned up at places on this date, but they weren't correct. On the first year anniversary, there were a lot of disappointed people about. It took a while before anyone claimed to have solved the game. 
It was a letter in Popular Computing Weekly from February 1984, with someone calling themselves a faithful pie maniac, and it was declared a done deal. But they were wrong. Some went to extraordinary lengths too, and it was rumoured one player even turned up in Bethlehem on Christmas Day hoping to win the prize, and they were wrong as well. Two years passed and some claimed the whole thing was a hoax or a publicity stunt, and that there was in fact no prize at all and no way to win the game. Computer and video games magazine writer Keith Campbell was one such voice. Hints though still kept appearing, and the next possible date for claiming the prize was 1985. A feature in Sinclair User reveals, in April 1985, no one had still got the answer right. But then the 22nd of July turned up. But would the prize be claimed this year? Yes, it was. Sue Cooper and Liz Newman turned up at the mouth of the white chalk horse in Sussex, and waiting there for them was the Pie Man, and more importantly, the Sundial. The game and treasure hunt were over, and Computer and Video Games magazine had to eat humble pie. The solution was then published in a book, revealing the important clues. The game map, when drawn out, is in the shape of a horse. The date was obvious, and listening using the hearing aid in the oily drum, which was of course the horse's ear, would reveal C-A-G-G, C-A being the symbol for calcium, you know, chalk, and G-G being the childish name for a horse. And of course when you did this you were in the horse's head. Now it all made sense, sort of. The location was a little tricky. But the view from the horse's mouth using a telescope described it all, well, almost. The compass is like the one at the location, and there were a few more obscure clues as well. That was it, the end of an era. And I haven't even mentioned the music yet. Oh well, that's for another day, I suppose. Nor have I mentioned Masquerade, the book with a real-life treasure hunt that was published before Pymania, and that may, or may not, have inspired this game. Well, I think it's time to move on then. In 1983, a different style of arcade game was released, Track and Field by Konami. This moved away from shooters, racing games and platform games, and took the player into the world of athletics. Yes, sir. It was very popular, and it wasn't long before home micros got versions, most of the time unofficial. Ocean got the British Decathlon gold medalist from the 1980 and 1984 Olympics to put his name to their version, which obviously gave it a great advertising potential. This is Daily Thompson's Decathlon, released by Ocean Software in 1984. The game covered all ten events of the Decathlon, depicting Daily as a white sprite, running, jumping and throwing various things. The events included the 100 meters, 100 meters hurdles, long jump, shot put, high jump, 400 meters discus, pole vault, javelin and lastly the 1500 meters. To cram all this into a spectrum, the game was in two parts. The first event is the 100 meters, and this involves thrashing the left and right keys as fast as you could, or waggling your joystick. This game was nicknamed the Joystick Killer because of the number of joysticks that got broken due to over-enthusiastic hammering. To continue you have to hit the qualifying time, which in this event is fairly easy. The game has some nice smooth scrolling too, and an animated crowd should you get a good time. Throughout the game there are variations on the left-right jump combination. Sometimes you have to throw, sometimes you have to set angles and then throw. Using the three keys was a good idea, and all of the events are shown well. Sound is very minimal though, with just a firing sound for the starter gun, the sound of the crowd cheering, and the music. Some events, like the long jump, give you three attempts to reach the qualifying distance, and there's a nice comical event if you fail. On to the shot put, and here we just hammer down the track, get to the line, set the angle by holding down the jump key, and release, and hopefully your shot will travel the right distance. The high jump is tricky. You hit top speed, you hit the jump key to get a good angle, and then again to arc your back over the top of the bar. 
This keeps going with the bar getting higher until of course you fail. There's clever use of colour in the game with attribute bars, meaning that only a few areas actually scroll, with lines depicting the track movement. The long races like the 400 meters and 1500 meters requires less key bashing. As for this you focus on the speed bar to maintain a decent speed rather than going all out which will tire out little daily. Day 2 when we start with the hurdles. You sprint and hit the jump key to clear them. The jumping bit is tricky and the timing is very precise. Jump too soon and you hit the hurdle. Jump too late and you hit the hurdle. You can though usually get a good qualifying time. On to the pole vault and this is like the high jump but trickier. You have to approach the bar and plant your pole if you pardon the expression. And here you have to keep the key held down until you get to the top and then release it to let go of the pole. Obviously the discus event changes the viewpoint to above and the left and right controls spin daily round. At the right time you hit the jump key and the discus shoots off hopefully in the right direction. If you fail or the discus goes in the wrong direction, a huge daily suddenly appears in the middle of the screen and scratches his head, completely ignoring the viewpoint that the game has set. The javelin brings back the angle choice before throwing. You run down the track as fast as you can and as you approach the line, you press and hold the jump button. You wait for the angle to be right and then release and hopefully your javelin will get the distance you need. Another fairly easy event to qualify in. Lastly we get the 1500 meters, the boring one. And here we get a balance of speed and energy to make sure daily doesn't run out of steam. You don't hit the keys alternatively like the other parts of the game. Instead you hold either left or right to increase the speed and jump to decrease. And this is a really dull part of the game. It's quite impressive how many animations Daily has, and I know there are a few that are reused, like the running one for example, but even so you have long jump, high jump, pole vault, all different. The game itself was a massive success. It was a top seller and people were buying it in their masses. It was also widely copied, much to the annoyance of Ocean, who introduced a new loader into the game to try and stop this happening. The bleeps in between the tones often cause purchase versions not to load as well though, which was a bit of a home goal really. The game is still good to play just to see if you can get through all the events, which I've failed to do. A great track and field game then, and a major achievement in getting Daly to put his name to it. Two other games followed using the same license, Daly Thompson's Super Test in 1985 and finally Daly Thompson's Olympic Challenge in 1988. The original though is still a classic, even though the gameplay may seem a bit dated. Delta Charge was originally released on the C64 as just plain Delta, with a cracking Rob Hubbard soundtrack. The Spectrum version, now renamed, lacks that music and has a reduced colour palette. It's a horizontal shooter that has potential to be a good game, but it just doesn't deliver. The graphics are monochrome with a decent star field and the first set of aliens are impossible to hit unless you memorise the attack patterns and place your ship where they're going to appear on screen. Going in too late will only mean a loss of life. After a few alien attacks you get a series of square blocks, one of which may possibly give you a bonus, although knowing where the blocks are is important, and you do at least have time to see them before they collide with you. After a few of these you get a spinning alien that marks the end of the level, and here this is where things turn out bad. At first I didn't know why I kept getting killed, and then I realised it's actually firing at me. The alien bullets are completely lost in the starfield, it's impossible to see them, and therefore impossible to dodge, and that's a real frustration. To get past this I ended up using a poke, so I could see the rest of the game. The next level and we get a landscape, but again it's in monochrome and there's not that much detail to be honest. The aliens are more lively here, with different patterns, but they still fire missiles at you that you can't see because of the star field. Most of this happens in silence too, which is a bit disappointing. 
you get a weak firing sound and a ping when you collect an item, and that's about it. At one point I collected too many speed power-ups and was unable to negotiate some of the landscapes, I just kept crashing into them. I was hoping for a better game to be honest. Things seemed to be a mixture of unfair attacks, blocks that are impossible to pass and unavoidable collisions. This coupled with the weak sound, even on 1 to 8k machines, makes me dislike it. I didn't enjoy it at all, and I love shooters, which is a bit sad really. Maybe one to avoid then. On to level 3 and we get Flappy Bird, hmm, okay. Perils of Willy was released on the VIC-20 in 1984, and was placed seemingly between Manic Miner and Jet Set Willy. Miner Willy has been out on the town and is now very drunk, and his challenge, and yours, is to get him home safely. You guide Willy through numerous screens of madness that we have now become accustomed to on a Matthew Smith game, although I'm not sure if Matthew actually wrote the VIC version. This is the only Miner Willy game not to have appeared on the Spectrum, if you discount the fabled Miner Willy meets the Taxman and the Megatree. Alan Turvey though set out to correct this and here it is. Anyone familiar with the VIC version will notice the difference in screen size, and this is because the VIC resolution does not match that of the Spectrum. However, we do get a decent version of the game, and the screen layouts do look the same. The jumps are longer on the VIC version, and a little bit slower, and you can stop on conveyor belts, unlike this version. The challenge is certainly there, and there are a host of new monsters that Specky fans may not be familiar with. Gameplay is typical Willy style, but having played the Vic version, there are a few omissions, which means you can't do things that you can do on that game, and this means the timings of jumps, for example, are even more important. One to check out then, if you like minor Willy games. When did you start writing your game and or your first games for the Spectrum, I presume, when you got it? Yeah, I did. Oh, I used to write basic games. I did a lot of moving a dot around the screen. I, I've done some quite complex basic games, not running in around 40, 48k nearly, almost filling the memory up. Mm. Some of which have been shown on the Patreon videos. So I, I sort of spent lots and lots of time writing those with the aim of trying to get them published, but that never happened. Yeah, none of mine I even thought of getting published. They were never good enough. I once sent a game to CRL and they lost it. I think the, the whole CRL incident sort of tainted everything. I, I but... used to try and write more practical software. Well, right, way back in the day, I wrote a thing for Dungeons & Dragons where it would work out all the um, hit rolls that you needed for a various monster. You, put right. your, you could put your party simulators, and my friend Lee, who was always our dungeon master, refused to use it because he thought I'd somehow bias it to myself. <laughs> well, why not? I, I once, uh, with a friend, or should I say I wrote most of it, wrote a very basic tool to mm. design kitchens. Oh, cool. That sounds good. So you would put in the measurements of the room and it would scale it down so that it fitted the screen the best it could and then it used the same scaling to put in standard sized kitchen units so you could move them about line drawings and things oh, that sounds quite cool huh? uh, sadly it was on uh, stored on microdrive and i sold them all so i've not even got a copy of that sadly did you try any of the games designers no and that probably brings us to your modern games doesn't it you tell me about using game designers uh, there were several i've covered them before briefly but H herg was rubbish it took a lot of messing about to get anything out of it. That was by Melbourne House. 
Games Designer by Quicksilver was probably the best one. You got sort of instant results, but you were fixed to a set game styles like Asteroids or Space Invaders, and you couldn't export them to standalone games. Games Creator was awful. You had to load in multiple parts multiple times and then change something and load it and load it and load it. That was awful. Mm. Uh, which brings us nicely onto Arcade Games Designer from Jonathan Caldwell, which revolutionised the homebrew scene, I think, in some aspects for the Spectrum. Yeah, and you've written quite a few games using that. I have. I started off as just a test with Kid Cadet and then moved on from that into lots of other styles for space disposal and platform games and puzzle games. So, yeah, I really enjoyed using that because it was easy and quick to use and, and it was quite powerful because you could actually write code to do things that it wasn't meant to do. And it's, it's recently been expanded a lot into AGDX, which has got a lot more features. Sadly, I haven't got a lot of time to use it now, but it's something that I really enjoyed doing. Yeah. So that's using just a games designer element where you go in and you've got tools to create sprites, you've got tools to create effects like star fields, you've got tools to set the keys and the jump and all that sort of stuff. But you uh, have done it the hard way, I believe. You, you're you hand coding in what language? C. You're, so you're coding in C and compiling it or cross-compiling it back to to Z80. Yeah, so you, you write your C or you, you need your C files on a desktop. So either Linux or Windows. I use Windows. I use that. And if you give me a second, I'll tell you the name of the compiler. Z88DK. Oh, I've heard of that, yeah. That's yeah. a library, though, isn't it? I thought that was a library rather than a compiler, or is that...? No, it's a compiler. So right. Z88 DK is a compiler. You basically you install it, and it's quite simple to install on, on a Windows PC. It's all command line, so you've got to give it a command line and give it a kind of make file and a list of files you want to compile. It's, it's pretty good. It's quite slow. All right. So what are you are coding in, in Notepad, or have you got a special IDE? Um, Textpad. So you code it up in TextPad. Just code it up in TextPad. Yeah. Okay. And if you, if, is there separate libraries for sound and graphics, or is that all hand yeah. coded as well? No, there's separate uh, separate libraries. So you can you can link in. You just do hash include on what you want to use. The game I'm writing, and I've I've nearly finished. It's probably about ninety percent done. Um, and are you are you prepared to tell any details about this game? Um. So I think I've said before, it's a cross between the Lords of Midnight and Bard's Tale. So it's an RPG. The kind of overworld hub is very Lords of Midnight, so you wander around that. Um, you've got to find various dungeons in that, and, you, and people and things like that. There's no fighting in the overworld, because I ran out of memory and my my combat <laughs> engine wouldn't fit in it. Then you can go into dungeons, and it's very 3D. looks a bit Bard's tale but it's, um, you fight things, and you get hit points, and there's various levels of dungeons, and... The fighting gets hard. I've I've played through the first five dungeons, which are completed at one point, and I had to do a bit of grinding to start off with. But that's that's a sign of a good RPG in my uh, in my opinion. <laughs> All sounds too much like hard work for me. I've really enjoyed it. Finishing it is difficult. I got a, started a new job what it last May, and I haven't been able to spend any time on it since. So I'm, I won't ask when it when it's due to be finished then. Well, I'm hoping that this gives inspires me. Doing this inspires me to to get on and do it. It'll be the only game I've ever released. And you did say I could release it on your um, website as well. There you go. That that's an incentive. That's our experience of writing games. And Paul, you've been a lot more successful than me. Ah, but you've not released yours yet. <laughs> You'll still have more than me. Trapped in an endless maze, populated by vicious androids, your only objective, survive. And that's the simple story. This is Androids by Sunshine Games, released in 1983. And here we get a crossover between Mazax from DKtronics and Android 1 from Vortex. You run around the maze, avoiding or shooting androids. You have limited shields and limited lasers, and these can be seen in the top panel. Both can be replenished though by collecting the G for lasers and S for shields. The aliens cannot pass through the Scion doors, so at least they don't chase you. Something you can use to your advantage. The screen moves pretty fast, but it's character-based scrolling, as is the rest of the movement. 
Sadly, there's no map view though, but then again, it is a 16k game. Sound is used well with some nice zaps and effects, and gameplay is quite good actually. It's great fun running around trying to survive, making sure you have enough lasers and energy power for the next encounter. There is an actual exit to the maze, if you are lucky enough to find it, but it just sticks you back in another maze to carry on. Overall, and I like this, it's a simple, challenging game, and what more do you need for a quick blast? As you may know, Sinclair wanted the Spectrum to be more than just a games machine, and in the early throes of the industry they tried to force this idea onto the public by producing, or commissioning, software titles to back this up. Amongst the titles was a series called Learn to Read, produced by Macmillan Software in 1983. There were five titles in the series, each with multiple parts. They were boxed in attractive packaging, similar in design to the ROM cartridges but a little larger, and each having a cartoon-like animal on the front. To go through each tape and review the multiple sections would take a long time, so I'll pick the first one in this instance to give you an idea of what Sinclair were trying to do with the Spectrum, and of course the quality of the titles. I have looked at the education market before, and will do so again in later episodes. Let's start then, Learn to Read 1, with its happy dog bouncing along the cover. The booklet inside contains instructions for parents about how they can help their child to read using this software and the role of the microcomputer in education. There is also an introduction to the characters your child may encounter, and the first program will let your child learn the names of the characters. This tape has five different sections, and picking the first one, each of the characters is drawn and their names spelt out in large text. One is then singled out and the child has to remember the name. This is done by pressing a key when the moving square covers the correct one. Not in itself educational, but an aid to remembering the characters' names. Moving on to the next part, and now you can copy the names of the animals by typing them in, after the computer has shown you what to do. Not very inspiring, again, just learning the names of the characters. Next we have a very similar game, if you can call it that, and you are shown how to spell the name of each animal, again, and then when asked, you type it back in. Next, yet again, something very similar, each of the characters is shown in full and you are shown how to spell their names, yet again, and then you have to enter them, yet again. This whole tape seems to be about copying whatever's written on screen. And finally we get to the game part. Yes indeed, there's a game, and here you turn over the cards one by one, and try to match the pairs. The whole set of programs is slow to use, but I suppose this helps the child, and the graphics are quite good really, and there are a few tunes scattered about to keep them entertained. The box does not say what age group it's aimed at, but the booklet states between 3 to 4 years old, and later 4 to 5 year olds. I suppose it depends on the child. This is the first in the series then, and does introduce the characters that continue through series 2 to 5. Once a child is familiar with them, then learning slowly becomes fun, as we may see in a later episode. 